One, one, two, we in here, we in your house, males and females. We in here trying to shake you up, getting you ready for a Monday morning. Make the best of it, it's your weekend call. An exceptional weekend duty, it's been rough lately. We want you to shake it off with the Monday morning duties, you know what I mean? That's right, because we peep the hair until it says... Hey, welcome to this new video. Um, this video's topic is how do we fix the lead problem? So, we know by now with all this lecture, this content that you've had, this research that you've done, that lead is a real environmental problem. And it's also one that has been around for a long time, since a while. And that also could last a long time, as we've known that lead like to persist in soil. But knowing about it is one thing. Today, what we will see is, what can we do about it? Your assignment for today um, is gonna be to add a page to your Google site and that describes a remediation plan for the property that you sample if it's contaminated or if your property doesn't have a lead issue to prepare a plan for either Paul or Nico's home um, since we do. And you'll find the information for Nico's and Paul properties posted on Blackboard if necessary. Your plan should of course include the specific action items and then we'll give you, I will give you today the tools and that you need to determine what action items that could be. It could be removing soils, it could be changing the siding of a house or it could be changing the plumbing of a particular uh, kitchen. We will also ask you to estimate the cost of remediation or action to remediate for lead. For that, I will also give you some tools to estimate the cost, but you also need to do some research on your own. So it's clear that lead contamination is everywhere. Uh, it's in the soils, in the water, in the atmosphere in the form of dust, in backyards, in front yards, in kitchens, and even in bedroom and living room in indoor dust. So how do we make sure that people don't get contaminated? Well, we can summarize the solutions in three words. Mitigation, abatement, and remediation. So what do, does it mean? Mitigation is actually the action of reducing the severity, the seriousness, or the painfulness of something. For lead, when we think about mitigation, we think about lowering the risk, lowering the health risks. The term abatement, however, involves the removing of the problem from a structure that we call generally decontamination or removing of part of the problem which is called encapsulation. And we're going to see that it's an important aspect of abatement, this encapsulation. And finally, the third term remediation actually typically involves abatement at one stage of a larger plan. Remediation has for goal to completely address the underlying problem and prevent it from happening ever again. So in a sense, the three are connected, but they have different level of involvement. There is often a confusion, in fact, between these terms, but clearly the goal, the ultimate goal when you're confronted with this contamination or with a contaminated site is to remediate it. But the mitigation and the abatement may sometimes be considered as part of a remediation strategy. You will have noticed that I changed my background today and I actually just turned 180 degrees compared to previous videos to show you part of what can be done for mitigation. And I'll talk more about that. So what about mitigation? Well, mitigation is a large fraction of the remediation effort. In fact, a large fraction of the mitigation effort for lead in soil, water and dust is what I am doing right now. What you are doing as well through this course is education. An informed population will limit contact with toxic chemicals and employ strategies to avoid exposure. That's mitigation. Paul, hi, are applying mitigation strategy to avoid contamination of our children. What it means is that we inform people of the risk. We enforce frequent hand washing in our families. Although we live on lead contaminated property, 
we frequently vacuum indoor and actually my room bot is a miracle worker with that and we also identify specific risk areas because we know what the source of lead in the environment is so we can do this and right now yourself are actually doing mitigation work you're doing that now by taking this class you can educate the community of the risk of lead contamination because you know about it you can educate the community of the effects of lead contamination and you also are going to be able and are already able to provide specific strategies to avoid it the more you speak the better it is and you are the voice i want to take an example among the students in the class and you are all doing a fantastic work but i want to point out to one specific video that is been has been seen on youtube more than 200 times of one of you one student in that class about uh, lead in gasoline kyla has been putting that video together um, on one of your assignments and she already has followers and therefore i've been able to reach more than 200 people talking about lead people that don't necessarily know about the lead issues so of course you're not all youtubers um, with an established audience like Kyla, but at each and every one scale, we can make an impact. So mitigation is one part, but what about full remediation and abatement? Well, it opens different, depend actually on the source of contamination and the setting. So let's start with lead in drinking water. For lead in drinking water, you want complete remediation. No detectable amount of lead in drinking water is acceptable and for that i also want to point out to one specific study that i saw on the internet that was published in january of this year if you look at that map it's the result of lead analysis in several schools in pennsylvania the size of the circle represents the level of lead in drinking fountain or drinking water in some of the schools so some have smaller circles but i remember any amount of lead is bad in drinking water. The most contaminated drinking fountain that was found in during that study contained 3,750 ppb of lead. This is 350 times what the state of Pennsylvania consider as okay, which is 10 ppb for them. in drinking water in a school so targeting the people the kids that are the most at risk in this case there is no question it needs to be completely and fully remediated and so that means you need to change something when that happens you need to remove the pipes there's very likely lead pipes everywhere i also want to mention that this is a social justice issue just like paul said in his video for this particular school in Philadelphia, Douglas Elementary, they knew there was a lead problem already starting in 2007, where they analyzed even more lead in the same fountain and they did nothing. I also want to point out that this school is in one of the poorest area of Philadelphia. It's a school where there is only uh, students of color. And I think that's important to think about that and to think about the answer of society towards social justice for environmental problems. So the best practice to remediate lead in water is to replace the piping with copper pipes. But of course, this has some cost. And in fact, it's estimated that for a single family house, it costs between $2,500 and $15,000 to change the piping if the piping is lead. That depends on how much pipe actually you need to change if there is several bathrooms if the piping goes into the house as well as into the, the floors etc so that's that's a lot if the system is larger than just a single house for example at the city scale it will take years to change all of that but it will also take millions but we need to do that it's important now, most TD todays actually have anti-corrosion additive to the water and that limits the potential lead to come in areas where you would not be able to test them. 
So that's part of the remediation effort, but this is in no way a solution. The solution is to remove the source, and that's the key. In order to decontaminate anything, salt, water, atmosphere, there cannot be any source still present in the environment. It, we'll see that it's extremely important for all aspects of lead contamination. Now, for large-scale projects, as well as for single-family housing, there is actually some public money that is spent to help curb the issues of lead contamination. But it's very rare and it happens only in selected areas of the country. EPA is one that actually helps large projects um, of remediation, often city or county or state-wide projects. And the money that they provide is actually generally trickling down to city-specific programs and help homeowners. One example of that is um, the Burlington Lead program in Burlington. Um, this is not EPA money, but uh, it's HUD money, so the uh, Housing and Urban Department of Housing and Urban Development, which has given millions to the city of Burlington to curb the lead problem by providing free estimates, um, by also helping homeowners and landlords to clean the lead, mostly indoor lead in this case. I also looked online and I saw that the city of Jackson has a program to protect babies from toxic chemicals. It's a project that started in March 2019, so it's an interesting one, you should check it out. I have here an image of a news announcement for that project. There are other more local things. There is, for example, things that are done. I checked in a few of, of the areas where the students live right now. Uh, the city of Newport, uh, Rhode Island, has a program, and here is a snapshot of the website. The city of Falmouth, uh, Massachusetts, have also some kind of program that I put together, or at least some information that are given to owners. I also will show you that video where there is even cities that have, are spending the money that is necessary to completely replace service lines that are not normally under the responsibility of the city. And that is amazing. So that's amazing that for more knowledge and education, actually things are done to make this happen. Two details this afternoon regarding the PWSA and lead lines. On display today is a new and what is considered less disruptive technique for replacing old lines. Christine D'Antonio has the story. You can see the trenches that have been dug here along Phillips Avenue in Squirrel Hill. This is all in an effort by PWSA to replace those lead service lines with copper ones. It's important for the health of the community. David Kovacek is the superintendent of this lead service line replacement program. Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority says it's a costly and extensive task, having to replace 2,100 lines just this year, a number that the state mandates. We will replace the public side of the line, which goes from the curb stop out into the street, connect with the main, and this year we're replacing the private side all the way into the house. The reason to figure out what works best and costs the least, this is called the pool method, which is innovative and less disruptive. Through that lead line and then run a cable, pull the cable through with the string line. It's all lead line. It's the old lead line. We're pulling right now. This morning, things went smoothly. This method is desired simply because we don't have to excavate the yard. We wouldn't have to take out that tree we wouldn't have to actually excavate in under the porch. It won't always be this easy, but crews will become acclimated with conditions in several different neighborhoods across the city before tackling all 15,000 lines that need to be replaced over the next few years. Now, the total cost of this project is quite costly. It's around $40 million, but it's necessary, according to officials. Customers will be footing the bill for this one. In Squirrel Hill, I'm Christine D'Antonio, KDKA TV News. No, what about indoor dust? We've talked about lead in water, but what about um, indoor dust? Well, it comes mostly from two sources lead paint on walls and fixtures, or outdoor dust that is carried inside. So, in order to effectively remediate indoor dust, one must actually replace all painted walls, floor, doors, windows inside the house 
but also, and that's extremely important, also remediate the soils outside because a large fraction of the dust indoor is dust that comes from outside. And that is expensive. It's in the order of tens of thousands of dollars just for the indoor, just for replacing these walls, fixtures, etc. Not talking about the soil. But the solution is again that you need to remove the source of lead. So often what is done is to actually remove the most dust producing sources, door frames, window seals, sink, sashes, places where there's a lot of friction and dust is created, and encapsulate the walls, meaning cover the walls with sheetrock or paint over the lead paint in the walls with non-leaded paint, of course. Of course, that will not remove the source and will need to be periodically maintained. And that is in the responsibility of the owner to make sure that you keep an eye on peeling paint, regularly cover peeling paint and fix this area. What is also extremely important is to never ever sand lead paint. Sanding lead paint will produce a huge amount of dirt, dust and dust will be extremely easily inhalated. Now, of course, again, we're talking about the cost, right? How much does it cost to delay, to completely remediate or to abate correctly this? And here is an image that actually compares various cost. And you'll see why encapsulation is often used is that it's a cheap method on top of mitigation that is actually a f almost free method. Now, what about soils? Well, soils are actually, interestingly, one of the largest sources of lead in the environment. And what it comes from is the accumulation of dust from both the exhaust and the paint on the house. What is pervasive in that is that it actually can spread very easily to nearby areas and contaminate, it, contaminate soils that are not necessarily supposed to be impacted because they may be nearby a more recent structure. So to fully remediate, actually, lead contaminated soils, we have to do two things. We have to remove the lead that is in the soil, or the soil itself that is contaminated, but also, and that's extremely important, eliminate the source of lead, which most often is going to be paint on the siding of the house. Now, because lead likes to be solid, you know that, right? The most common elimination method is going to be the dig and dump method. It means that you dig up the contaminated soil and you replace it with uncontaminated soil. Of course, in parallel, you must reside the house or at least encapsulate the source of lead. So, either remove the wood siding of the house or make sure that the paint that is on the side of the house is not flaking, is not adding lead to the soil. Here is some view of what the dig out, dig out of the dig and dump is. In the news this morning, more than 100 people living on our city's northeast side are about to have their yards completely torn up. And that's all because the EPA says the soil around their homes is contaminated with lead. The project affects up to 100 properties in the Martindale Brightwood neighborhood. Our Emily Longnecker tonight explains where the lead came from and why the affected area could actually expand. I bought that house in 2004. If Marshall Davis knew 12 years ago what she knows now, that the ground around her house was contaminated with lead, I wouldn't have bought that house. She didn't know, though. And now Davis is one of dozens from the Martindale Brightwood area meeting with the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA plans to dig up lead-contaminated soil in people's yards and put clean ground in its place. The properties that um, will get cleaned up first are the properties where there are children living or staying there. Studies show lead exposure can cause learning disabilities, behavioral issues, even death in children whose brains are still developing. Sure, yeah, we all know how lead can affect uh, young people. This will be the third time the EPA has cleaned up lead-contaminated soil in the area. The first time was in 2005. The contamination then was traced back to smoke from a lead plant that used to be in the neighborhood until the late 60s. The EPA has just learned the same plant used to give dirt to neighbors for their yards. Dirt that had lead in it. Lead that's still there, 
50 years later. We know there are high blood lead levels in this community. We know there are high levels of lead in the soil. And so it's extremely important that we get this started. Some of the work already has on the site of what used to be a neighborhood sports center on Ralston Avenue. There are future plans to build a leadership and legacy academy here. Oh, I did gymnastics there. Now about to have her first child, Erica Smith is about to move. Her mom, though, will be staying. Hopefully they're able to, a lot of people are able to get their soil resoiled. Marshall Davis says she'll do whatever it takes to be on that list. I don't care if I'm the first or the, or the last, but my yard needs to be dug up. The contaminated yards here in the Martindale Brightwood area that the EPA plans to dig up are spread out over 400 acres and they're not all side by side. The EPA says they plan to do more testing of yards this fall and think that these hundred yards that they have to fix won't be the last. Andrea. Of course, this method is extremely efficient because it removes the source of lead in the soil and it removes the source of lead on the house. But it has two main problems. It's extremely expensive. And what do you do with contaminated material? The wood siding of the house, the contaminated soil. If we do that everywhere really fast, we're going to run out of whom to put this contaminated material. We're going to run out of clean soil as well. And that's what needs to be accounted for when we think about remediation. There's the cost of excavation and the cost of new soil. And I want you actually to look at, uh, at these cost estimates for removing salts in a, a fairly large industrial site. Look at how much it costs. What is the main, the most important cost of remediating this site? This is cost associated with excavation of the soil, load and disposal of the soil. These two items that are there, but together we come for a million dollars. And we can make the calculations ourselves. Here's what, when you Google cost of excavating contaminated soil, you, you will get, it will give you about $1,500 per ton. Now, a ton of soil is about three quarter of a yard cube. Well, that's about 20 cubic feet. If we are conserved, we could even say that one ton of soil is one cubic yard, kind of. We can actually calculate the number of tons of salts that are needed to remove to, let's say, depths of one third of a yard all around the structure to a yard of one distance from the structure, of any kind of size structure. If we do that for, let's say, a 10 by 10 yard house, this fairly small house, um, we would need to remove 10 yard cube of soil at the cost that is estimated from, from the web, uh, and I'll take actually a thousand dollars because 1,500 is the higher hand of the estimate. You can actually find estimates that are lower in the, in the 700, in the 500. If we take a thousand dollars for 15 yard, cubic yard of soil, that's $15,000. If you wanna replace that with new soil at about $10 a yard, um, that's 150. So if we sum all of this cost, a new paint job, for example, uh, or residing of the house, a, new, a paint job is about $2,000. Residing of a house is between $5,000 and $15,000, depending on the material and the size of the house. So in truth, doing a ding and up, removing the soil, is not necessarily a sustainable method because it will displace the contaminant, but not necessarily eliminate completely the source. And also, and that's probably the most important aspect, it's not just socially. Only people that can afford to spend 50 to $60,000 could remediate their house. So researchers are actually looking at other methods, methods that are more sustainable, and that may very well be the future of remediation. One that is a leading potential remediation strategy is the use of amendments. And that's one that actually we research in my group. It's the idea that you can lock up the lead that is present in the environment in a form that is not gonna be bioavailable. In a form that will not enter the bloodstream, the brain, the bones of humans. And we do that by adding phosphate. So by adding phosphate into 
lead that is available, you will actually form pyromorphite, which is a mineral that even if you ingest it, will not dissolve in your gastric fluids. Now, this is a very promising method and it has been proven to work, but the problem is that there's no one recipe for all sites all over the world. And that the amounts of phosphate that need to be added will vary greatly between sites based on pH, lead concentration, soil mineralogy, organic matter content, etc. And so there's more research that needs to be done in order to standardize this method and make it the most efficient. Another popular method is phytoremediation. And it's actually the use of plants to extract lead from the soil. What it actually shows is that if you can plant some type of vegetation, you actually, this vegetation will be able to absorb the lead, extract the lead from the soil and capture it. And so you can get rid of the plant later on. And there are several different plants that are well suited. Some of them are very frequent, like sunflowers, mustard. But finally, I think that what can and should be done on any property with lead at a low cost, not removing the contamination if effectively, but at least at a very low cost in a social, socially just way, is some form of mitigation. And that means do not allow kids to play in areas where there is likely a lot of lead. Even if you don't know if there's a lot of lead, if it's a whole house, it's very likely that there's a lot of lead just nearby the house, in drip zones. Do not allow kids to play in this area. Do not grow food in high lead area in the same areas. And in fact, I suggest you do this kind of stuff, even far away from the house, to grow food. Like the house is very far. Most lead is coming from this area. And I grow my food here, away in raised beds. In raised bed, why? Because we want to avoid the roots from reaching the soil underneath. And my wife and I, when we built this raised bed, we calculated, we estimated based on, on what is known about the plants, how deep the roots are gonna go so that we can grow tomatoes, for example, here. Tomatoes are growing at 36 inches away from the old soil, just in new soil. And actually what I often see is people are using raised bed often in Burlington, but they use raised bed only that are four inches high. This is not enough. You basically do not um, avoid roots from growing in contaminated soils. Another thing that can be done, and it's done very effectively in Burlington, but I'm sure everywhere else, is that just restrict access to the high lead areas add rocks, grow plants, make it not accessible so that the wind cannot pick up the dust, people cannot access these areas, etc. And I will finish by one thing. I think the most impactful thing you can do to fix the lead problem today is talk about it. And actually by taking that class, by building that website, by creating your final video, that's your assignment for the next lecture, you are extremely impactful. So talk about it to your family, your friends, your neighbors, and you will change the world. That's it for today. Thank you. One, one, two, we in here, we in your house, males and females. We in here trying to shake you up, getting you ready for a Monday morning. Make the best of it, it's your weekend call. An exceptional weekend duty, it's been rough lately. We want you to shake it off for the Monday morning duties, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's right, cause we peep the head through, it says a bad head day No brush, so it's the same way every day Always rush, you trying to get you a payday Hard pressed to get a little bit of fair play I'm obsessed with cash, yeah, dinner is an empty plate No bread, so no wonder we're trying to get his cake Hard times, I promise, trying not to let him break Yo, one, one, two, we here, we like to see you shake the balls Go ahead and shake it, shake it, shake it all, yeah, shake it Make it an emergency, come on, shake it Shake it, shake it all, sugar, shake it Show him how you do that, mommy now Shake it, shake it, shake it all, sugar, shake it Take it in emergency, come on Shake it, shake it, shake it all That's your weekend, call, go ahead, don't hold back Call six, 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 six,
yo, so convinced with the victims of greed. The sun down, sees an angry mob busy plotting for vengeance. At night time, sees the counting the sheep. Morning sees the quick to look into the eyes to carry guilt and penitence. Hard feelings, can't see past the pain. Focus, don't really forgot about at the national mention of day. I know it's bitter here, makes it hard to think straight. The anger makes it hard to maintain. That's why we're here to help you shake it, shake it, shake it on. Shake it, make it any much. Come on, shake it, shake it, shake it all. Be listening, stay in tune in life, learn about harmonies. That's the only song playing while most people's opinions are distant. We all frustrated, trying to handle their biz. They all looking for that luxury and forgotten to live. But who you, but who you are, showing on TV, making you feel dead already. Leave your soul and breathe.